Hi, everyone. Thank you for bearing with us there just uh, for that minute delay. Uh, we're just going to give another couple of minutes um, to get started here tonight. Of course, I'm here with Jane O'Neill, who is our wonderful art historian who comes online with us every every month. But tonight, I definitely am really excited about this program. I know um, it's, uh, I, I don't know, I, I love Picasso's art, but I realize that there could be some problem, it's kind of problematic there, but I'm okay with that um, to a certain extent. Um, but uh, but we're gonna we're gonna learn about Picasso tonight. Um, if you haven't uh, attended a program with Jane O'Neill before, um, Jane O'Neill is the founder of Culturally Curious, an arts education consulting firm specializing in art appreciation programs. She curates and delivers programs throughout New England and beyond. Uh, she holds a master's degree in history from Boston University and a master's in education. Uh, from Harvard University. Born and raised in New Hampshire, she has worked at some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director, and the Courier Museum of Art, where she held a role, the role of senior educator. Jane has also taught at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at Southern New Hampshire University. And for more information, please visit I am culturally curious, all one word, dot com. Tonight she presents art on uh, Picasso's women. Uh, women have served as important collaborators and muses throughout the history of art. And that is especially true for the most celebrated artist of the 20th century. Learn more about the women in Picasso's life and how his visual innovations often reflected his relationships. Uh, so thank you again, Jane, so much for joining us tonight. It's my pleasure, Jess. Thanks so much for having me. And thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your day to learn a little bit more about Picasso. You are in for a treat over the next hour. There is a lot to discover here. I think you'll probably some, see some of your favorite Picasso paintings and maybe learn a little bit more about the sort of scandalous and controversial aspects of this famous artist's personal life. He did say, to my misfortune and maybe my delight, I place things according to my love affairs. So everything, well, everything that we're going to look at tonight really lines up with a couple of these major relationships that he had. Now, Picasso once said there are only two types of women goddesses and doormats. And we'll see how that plays out for him and the women that he was involved with. Um, we are going to focus on, I believe it's five major relationships tonight. Two of those women were driven to mental breakdowns and two of them ultimately took their own lives. So we are in for a lot of um, salacious details and, and often very heartbreaking details. But let's let's place this into some context, first of all. And we will get back to that gorgeous image on the title slide uh, in just a little while. But a little bit of context. When we think about the history of art and the art world in general, we oftentimes have this romantic notion of the artist's muse, this traditional notion of a male artist that's inspired by the, the stunning beauty of a female model. This is a painting by the French artist Ang, and it's his romantic idea of the Renaissance artist Raphael with, um, with a woman who served as his muse. Here she is sitting in his lap, at, well, at the same time he is studying this painting that he is making of her where she is sort of revealing her her um, her breasts to us the viewer over here on the right um, a man who needs no introduction and another titan of the 20th century Andy Warhol gazing adorably at Edie Sedgwick um, most often when we think about the artist and the artist muse it's a notion that's coded with um, with the idea of a love affair or at least in the case of Andy Warhol and Edie Sedgwick at least a very loving relationship relationship between the artist and the model. So sometimes that is, oh, sorry, skipped ahead. Sometimes that is, um, that becomes a little bit more complicated depending on who the artist is. So for example, the French impressionist artist, Edgar Degas had a really complicated relationship with women um, to the extent that a fellow impressionist, Edward Manet said, 
um, Degas was incapable of loving women. And I think um, for an artist who's so famous for painting ballerinas and nude bathers, you can see that sometimes, I mean, he cuts off the heads of his ballerinas, as you can see over here in, um, in his uh, portrayal of the orchestra from 1870. And over here on the right, when he's uh, doing a pastel of this bather, he's asking his model to hold a really uncomfortable pose for a very long time. So, um, um, so how does it really play out for an artist and, and his models uh, or his muses when, um, when he might have kind of a comp complicated relationship with women or with, um, with his muses in general? And that brings us, of course, to Pablo Picasso. This is a painting that's in the collection of the Wadsworth Art Museum in Hartford, Connecticut, one of my favorite little museums on the planet. This was painted in 1934 we'll be getting very familiar with this muse in just a little while. Here we can see an artist at his canvas here um, portraying this woman who's in front of him. And he's obviously created all of these distortions and elongations. I, I remember reading the label in, in the Wadsworth um, just a, a few weeks ago that they called these sort of erotic elongations as well. So we'll be able to judge for ourselves whether we think that there is um, a fondness kind of encoded in in some of the innovation that um that, that Pablo Picasso came up with during the 20th century or if there's something else going on there but first let me give you a sense in terms of how we're going to move through the material over this next hour don't you just love this photograph of Pablo Picasso I feel like we're going to have a little bit of pillow talk with him over the next hour it's very intimate so we're going to get started with an introduction to the artist and then we'll work our way through through these major relationships that he had and, um, and finish up with an epilogue on sort of where things stood with all of these um, important individuals here. Um, all right, so I've given you a little bit of a preview. Uh, things don't end well for a, a great number, the majority of, of his lovers. I will say that one of his biographers, uh, a historian by the name of Patrick O'Brien observed, Picasso's feeling for women oscillated between extreme tenderness on the one hand and violent hatred on the other, the midpoint being dislike if not contempt. Let's see how this plays out. So let's get started with an introduction to our artist here, an introduction to probably the most famous artist of the 20th century. We can see him standing here in a photograph um, in his studio in Cannes, France in um, 1956. Pablo Picasso, it's safe to say, was the most dominant and influential artist, especially of the first half of the 20th century, if not the entire century. And his work really came to define modernism for the entire globe. So along with George Brock, we know he pioneered cubism. He also invented collage and made major contributions to symbolism and surrealism. We'll be seeing a little bit of this along the way tonight. He was famously charismatic and his behavior in particular, his relationships with women um, came to embody this kind of bohemian notion that we had of artists working in um in our popular imagination, really, he, he sort of embodies uh, our, this modern notion of a bohemian artist for most people. Though he passed away nearly 50 years ago now, Picasso continues to be one of the most bankable artists on the planet. Since his death in 1973, he's been the most reproduced, the most exhibited, the most stolen, and the most faked artist of all time. That's quite an impact. Now, he one time compared himself to being King Midas. Everything he touched turned to gold. And that may be true for his art. We'll see how that plays out for the women in his life. Now, this is a little bit facile, but we, we're on limited time tonight. So we're just going to get a sense in terms of Picasso's incredible innovations over this long life and long career that he had. These self-portraits span the age of 15 all the way up to the age of 90. We can see that he worked in um, a variety of 
styles. He actually worked in a variety media as well. And it's this long career that stretches for about 75 years. And we can see that he was inventive and remarkably prolific throughout his life. Here is a photograph of young Pablo Picasso alongside a portrait that he created of his mother when he was just 15 years old. Now, Pablo Picasso was born in Spain um, in 1880, 1881, and he spent most of his life in France. He was um, about seven years old, about how old you see in the photograph over here, where he looks remarkably confident, am I right? Um, when he started to receive his formal training from his artist father. Now, um, it almost seems as though art making was in his blood. It said that, you know, one of his first words was the word for pencil. He gets this formal training from his artist father, and we can see that he is remarkably um, uh, adept at, at creating uh, realistic art by a very young age, but at the time that he's a teenager. Picasso's mom um, was uh, emphatically supportive of her young son. She once said to him, if you are a soldier, you will become a general. If you are a monk, you will become a pope. And Picasso said, instead, I was a painter and I became Picasso. So there's no shortage in terms of confidence and ego in the family. Now, let's turn our attention to what happened after Picasso leaves home. By the time he's 20, he's living in France. He's gravitated towards the, the sort of the center of the art world. And he starts this blue period in his career where he was incredibly poor and incredibly depressed. It wasn't that he, um, it wasn't that he was so poor that he could only afford one color. Um, it was that he was uh, really kind of exploring the color blue. Well, um, that also seemed to echo where he was in terms of his emotional state. Now, sometimes Picasso painted women that he didn't necessarily have a relationship with. In this case, he's actually painting a woman who was in a hospital slash prison. It was somebody that he met very briefly, but we can see in just a, a few short years, he's already kind of moving away from realism. He's abstracting and simplifying her face, her body, her clothes um, for, I, I think, especially dramatic impact. The image over here on the right is one of the most famous portraits that he ever painted. And this was done very early on in his career. This is his portrait of, um, of the incredibly important uh, patron of the arts, Gertrude Stein. She was an American expatriate living in Paris in the early part of the 20th century. And she was one of the only people along with her brother who is actually spending money on modern art. So artists like Picasso and Matisse were gravitating to her and really their livelihood depended on her. Uh, Picasso was in fact burning his own artwork to stay warm before he came into contact with um, Gertrude Stein. Now he painted this portrait of her in 1906. This is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And it was said that he, well, she said that she sat for him 90 times. I'm sure that was an exaggeration. And ultimately he said, I can't even see your face anymore. Um, you can just leave. He paints out her face and then ultimately paints in this kind of abstracted face that shows the influence of African sculpture with um, these kind of heavy lidded abstracted eyes that we can see he's not even really attempting to kind of match up to each other. There's a, a real kind of profound foreshortening here. And this all leads up to um, his kind of first attempt towards cubism, uh, the style for which he is most closely associated. And this is the painting called Les Demoiselles d'Avignon um, from 1907. It's in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. This is the most pivotal painting in his whole career. And it's uh, pivotal because of its dramatic sort of flattening and fragmenting of forms. And I think you can especially see that in the figure over here on the far left. Now, whenever I look at this painting or think about cubism in general, I think about getting boxes from Amazon, which we all do all the time, especially right now at the end of the year, and breaking down the boxes. It's like literally flattening those boxes to put them in recycling. That is what Picasso was doing and really started to do with this painting. But I think it's important to note that this is a painting of five naked prostitutes. We don't talk about that too much when we talk about Picasso and his innovations with um, this particular work. 
he is not rendering them as sensual or beautiful. Uh, he's hardening them and he's making them kind of terrifying. He's um, put two of them in these abstracted uh, sort of African mask-like faces over here. It should be noted that Picasso's own sexual experiences started in brothels when he was a very young man, probably around the age of 13 years old. Like his father, he began going to brothels um, just about every week right after unbelievably, uh, Catholic mass. <laughs> so, uh, so you could easily sort of extrapolate from that. And many art historians have that for Picasso, the idea that there's this idea that women existed solely for his convenience and his pleasure. And that permeates, um, not just throughout his life, but into his work. Now we've talked a little bit about cubism. cubism. This is really full blown cubism for Pablo Picasso. And the this is what art historians call uh, analytic cubism. It's a painting called Majoli, painted in 1912. This is also in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. Now, um, I showed this painting because out of all of his, his paintings that are sort of similar to the style, we know that this was a painting of one of his lovers. This is an expression of love. Um, his lover's name here was Marcel Humbert, and that's why he calls this painting and makes it very clear that the title is Majoli, which translates in French from from, um, from the French to English as like my pretty one. It was also a favorite dance hall song at the time. Uh, Picasso wrote, I love her very much and will write this in my paintings, referring to this woman. And you can see if you have really good eyes that there is a reference to a guitar that she is holding here with the strings right here at the lower center of the painting. So it relates, uh, everything sort of relates back to this famous song. But in general, what we see here are um, are like the the symbols, the uh, the recognizable elements of analytic cubism. It's flat. It's straight edge. It's um, these kind of semi transparent planes of of gold and beige and gray. Here we get the sense that there's uh, a, maybe a reference to a figure here, but everything is flattened and hardened um, in this case for us. And once again, we know that this is a, a depiction of somebody that he cared a great deal for. So just a few other things to note about Pablo Picasso before we move on to the, the major women in his life is that during the 1920s, Pablo Picasso becomes very interested in French surrealism. He actually claims to have invented the term surrealism, but he was in no way the leader of that movement. He always kind of stayed on the outside. Now at the core of French surrealism is this kind of fascination with the unconscious, sort of um, tapping into something in, in our brain that we are not even fully aware of, sort of letting go of, of, um, of really kind of intentional thought. But for Picasso, that was never his focus when it came to creating these kinds of paintings, which are from the late 20s over here on the left and the early 30s over here on the right. For him, surrealism was less about the unconscious mind and more about distorting reality and creating opportunities for um, um, these images that were really um, imaginative responses to the real world. The only thing that I think he really takes away from, from French surrealism is that there's uh, this kind of anxiety around sex uh, for the French surrealists. So oftentimes we'll see Picasso really distorting uh, nude women and, and sometimes uh, making them resemble like insects or birds or something like that. These two images in particular, I think have a lot of anxiety around sexuality. You'll notice that the face of this figure is kind of distorted. Her nose is um, elongated and sort of stretching to the left over here. Her mouth is turned sideways. And that makes me think that whatever's happening here in her body certainly looks like a vagina that is also turned sideways. Over here on the right, this is a depiction of one of his lovers reading a letter along with her sister. You'll notice how prominent he makes both of their breasts in, in this particular image. So just to wrap up on Picasso, 
Picasso in general and um, his life, his legacy, I think it's important to touch upon the fact that for Picasso, he was a full blown celebrity during his life. This is a photo of him working with the actress who was sort of known as a sex kitten in her time, Bridget Bardot, um, sort of watching over his shoulder. And the year here is 1956. So with all of the relationships that we'll consider today, all of these relationships with women that Picasso had, it's important for us to keep in mind that any sort of liaison that you have with Picasso has the promise of status. It has the, uh, maybe even a promise of celebrity. Certainly there's the promise of money there and the opportunity to be immortalized by a modern master. So there's, there's a lot at stake for everybody involved in these relationships. So let's turn our attention to one of the first major relationships in Picasso's life. Um, this was hardly his first love. Olga Koklova was hardly his first love. Picasso had ha already had a handful of significant love affairs probably many more lovers, um, but Olga was the first woman that he married. So let me introduce you to Olga Koklova. Here she is in two photographs. The couple met in 1917. He was 36 years old. She was 26. So there's a 10 year age gap. We'll see that age gap between him and his lovers keeps getting bigger and bigger. Now Koklova was a Russian ballet dancer and she and Picasso met while he was working uh, as a set and costume designer for this kind of revolutionary ballet um, based out of Russia. Now at the time that they met, Picasso was this bohemian and he was completely indifferent to social status. But according to historians, that was what really um, was a, an obsession for his wife. She was bourgeois, very, con uh, very concerned about appearances. And of course, she begins to appear in his artwork almost immediately. And over the course of the next two decades of their lives together, she appears in a variety of forms, sometimes almost um, in a quasi religious way and other times we'll see greatly distorted. But I think what's important early on in Picasso's relationship with Koklova is, um, is realism. They set up a life together in, uh, 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 in Paris. And at first their marriage is a happy one, despite the fact that they're, they have kind of different um, opinions about how to run their lives. Now, Picasso's cubism is in full swing, but for Koklova, she doesn't understand it. And she demands that she is rendered as realistically as possible. She wants paintings of her done in an academic style. So this looks nothing like Majo Lee that we saw before. We can see that it um, closely re resembles the photograph that was taken of Koklova right around the same time. This is a painting called Olga in an Armchair from 1918, created the very year that they were wed. Now, this period of Picasso's work is often referred to as this neoclassical period. Um, art historians uh, oftentimes cite the fact that it's because Olga wanted to look the way she looked like in real life in his pictures. But this is also inspired by the fact that Picasso had visited a museum in Naples, Italy the previous year, and he sort of continued this new interest in the classical past by studying neoclassical paintings at, um, at the Louvre in Paris when he got home. So we'll see how that sort of inspires his work. Here's a painting from a neoclassical artist named Ang. We already saw an example of his work tonight. Um, here is just a, a portrayal of, of a sort of a high class woman from the early 1800s. And we can see that Picasso is borrowing from this kind of painting in order to portray his wife early on in his marriage. We've got these kind of beautiful sweeps of the arms and the neckline in, in both of these pictures, the kind of contrast against uh, uh, the, the patterned uh, armchair or, or drapery in both of these images, and, um, and the suggestion of, of real status of, of, um, of an upper class lifestyle with both of these works. Now, the one big difference, of course, is uh, Picasso didn't finish his painting of his wife. He never gave the armchair that she's sitting in legs, and he never gave his ballerina wife feet. That seems a little unusual, doesn't it? So this pattern chair that she's sitting in just seems to kind of float there and she hovers kind of weightless. It seems as though he's pushing back on traditions to try and make some sort of modern statement here. But I think in some ways he might also be pushing back against his wife's, his wife's 
wishes here. Now, over the next few years, he creates um, a number of depictions of Koklova. Oftentimes she's sitting down, uh, sometimes deep in thought or sometimes reading a letter. These are two works from the early 1920s, Olga reading in an armchair and Olga lost in thought. Now, um, there's a couple of reasons as to why she's always sit, seated. For the sake of her husband, she gave up her career in the ballet. And then shortly after they got together, she really injured her leg. So even on their honeymoon, she had to spend many long hours just sitting there. But after they came back from their honeymoon, um, the Russian revolution is in full swing. There is a civil war um, in her homeland. And so she is waiting with all of this anxiety uh, to hear from her family, um, to hear that her father is missing, that you know uh, other relatives are, 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 are dead. And, um, and so she's receiving this news with uh, great gravity in a lot of these images. Incidentally, I remember seeing this picture when I was just a, a teenager and just being absolutely captivated by it. I thought um, this blue and also, you know, the, um, the sort of the, the loving attention that he gives to somebody who looks like they're so deep in thought here was just really stunning and beautiful. And I thought there was something so romantic about it. Picasso here has certainly captured her sadness and her pensiveness. And then um, Olga Koklovla, has a baby. And we begin to see that baby in Picasso's artwork. It was the year is 1921. Um, she gives birth to a son. He's named Paolo. He is incidentally Picasso's only legitimate child. Um, all of these images are called uh, maternity or something like it. And here we really see this neoclassical style um, in its greatest expression. He renders Olga as like this um, sort of larger than life, neoclassical, this kind of monumental figure in so many ways. And she's softened by these wonderful poses and, um, and gestures from her infant son here, very tender images. And, um, and we can see that there's kind of a reference to the form of the mother and child um, that's so prevalent throughout the history of art. But sometimes having a baby really changes things in relationships. And we can see it changes things in Picasso's marriage. So in the mid 1920s, just after this baby has arrived, their relationship begins to deteriorate. The family is wealthy enough that they have servants, but Koklova has little to do and apparently she felt very unfulfilled. Now it's interesting to go back through all of the literature related to Picasso's life, his marriage, because you can tell that there were a lot of male art historians that were really glossing over Koklova and, um, and her experience knowing that her husband was having affairs outside of their marriage, instead of focusing on that, one historian said she was increasingly jealous of Picasso and hurled accusations at him forever making a scene. But it, from my perspective, that would seem uh, sort of appropriate considering the fact that her husband was almost constantly cheating on her. On a trip to Monte Carlo, she was particularly hurt by her husband's uh, penchant for uh, painting young women. They actually encountered the ballet troupe that she used to be a part of, and he was welcoming or inviting all of these young ballerinas to pose and model for him. And here she was, the woman who gave up her ballet career being ignored by her own husband. So this is a painting called The Dance from 1925. It's a huge painting. It's purported, purportedly a depiction of Koklova. And I think you could read it in a number of ways, but certainly, and I think um, the, the, the most important element here is that he is not portraying her as she wanted to be portrayed realistically. He is abstracting her body. Um, I, I would, you could even say almost like abusing her body in some ways because her arms and her legs, every, every element, even her face is distorted here. Now it looks as though she's in this kind of triumphant releve. It looks like it's an exuberant, happy pose, but this is certainly not the time or not the kind of image that would make um, Koklova feel exuberant.
different. And this is, uh, could certainly be uh, considered a reflection of, of the change of Picasso's feelings about his wife. I think that is um, indisputable by the time we get to 1929 and we see this image here. This is called Woman in a Red Armchair and it's in a collection in Texas. And it's generally understood to be another portrayal of Koklova. Here she is a monster. Her head is the shape of an arrow. Her eyes are um, oriented in different directions. There's just this one row of teeth down one side of this kind of deformed head here, and then three long strands of hair on the other side. Her breasts are simply these tiny triangles pointing up at her face. For Picasso, his wife's jealousy, her reaction to his unfaithfulness was unfathomable to him. And it conjured up in him a contempt for her and maybe for women in general. So <laughs> what happens next? Uh, um, it was said that, oh, well, Picasso says, <laughs> it must be painful for a girl to see in painting that she's on the way out. And I'm sure for Koklova to, to look back a, a decade earlier and see how her husband painted her when they first fell in love and how he was painting her now must have been almost like a psychological trauma for her. So if she's on her way out, who is on their way in? Uh, young Marie Therese Walter, and she was young. <laughs> she was 17 years old when she met Pablo Picasso. She was 29 years younger than the artist they met in 1927. Now, one of Picasso's main requirements, apparently, for a mistress was that she be submissive to him and, um, and also shorter than him. And apparently, Picasso was only five foot four. So that sort of limited the range of who he he could have a romantic uh, uh, affair with. So um, apparently he saw Marie Therese Walter leaving the Metro in Paris one day and he said, you have an inter interesting face. I would like to do a portrait of you. And she said, I have no idea who you are. He brought her into a bookstore, showed her a book on him. And within a week, they were having a love affair. At this time, Picasso's son is five years old. And supposedly Koklova, his wife, would not know about this affair with Marie Therese Walter for about another eight years. I kind of find that hard to believe. So um, historians say that Marie Therese Walter, who we see here, was perhaps the most enduring love of Picasso's life. She was the only woman, apparently, that made him truly happy. Um, she's known as his golden muse. She was young. Like I said, she was submissive. Um, he saw her as sensual, voluptuous. And uh, here you can see from the photograph that she was um, she was athletic. She has this um, this kind of promise of youth in her and a lot of positive energy. So, what did his paintings of her look like? Aren't these gorgeous? These are these beautiful paintings inspired by Walter from the early 1930s. He always painted her with these kind of gentle round shapes, these kind of swooping lines, very confident lines, and these soft colors, these lavenders, um, offset oftentimes by this bright green over here. I, I think these paintings are just absolutely stunning. Um, as one art historian put it to Picasso, the sleeping wall Walter is free of constraint. She's an object of passionate desire and a living dream of the dewy intoxication of youth. In repose, Walter emanates serenity and calm, and it's with her that Picasso is said to have experienced true domestic harmony. So a lot is going on in his life that is very good. He's infatuated with her like a teenager. Apparently he even started carving their initials secretly into some of his paintings. This is a painting called The Dream by 1932. Um, Marie Therese Walter once said, he told me that I had saved his life and I had no idea what he meant. So clearly this affair and the intensity of it um, 
was something that was really powerful in his life. And I think you can see it making its way into his, into his art, particularly in the 1930s. Um, she becomes much more conspicuous because, and his, his depictions of her are, um, are much more sensual. Here she is resting her eyes closed and, and a breast exposed in this beautiful red armchair. Once again, all these sort of swooping uh, sensual lines here. We are a world away from that red armchair that he depicted his wife in um, just a year or two earlier. So um, Picasso essentially outs his affair with Marie Therese Walter by 1932. This is a painting called Nude, Green Leaves, and a Bust. And we can see over here on the right, Picasso standing in front of that same painting. Um, the, all of the, his works of Marie Therese Walter were exhibited at the end of 1932. You can imagine what it would feel like to be Olga Kokovla, Koklova walking into this exhibit and seeing all of these sensuous, beautiful, blonde, nudes um, throughout the exhibit. And these, uh, these pictures are, are, um, are uh, so er erotic, so, so grounded in their sensuality. Uh, for Picasso, his connection to Walter is really um, about the erotic, not about the cerebral. Apparently, Marie Therese Walter was, was very smart, but she wasn't necessarily an intellectual. This was a man who had a very physical relationship and physical connection to this young woman. Incidentally, this painting that we're looking at here um, sold for roughly 120 or the equivalent of 120 million dollars of today's money back in 1920 and 1910 sorry 2010 and for a very brief time it was the most expensive painting on the planet I think it is an absolutely gorgeous painting at that too so um so things begin to change for Walter and Picasso too Marie Therese Walter gives birth to a child Picasso so uh, next child who's uh, nicknamed Maya. The year is 1935. This is Maya, uh, just a few months old. Here is Marit Marie Therese Walter um, nursing Maya over on the right. And at this time, Picasso is already seeing several other women, but he does sort of remain true or his truest the, the truest form of him um, to Walter and this baby. He regularly sees them. Actually, he typically sort of installs them in an apartment and sees them regularly throughout the week. Now, things sort of shift for Walter after this, not consistently, but we do see that he begins to paint her in new ways on occasion. It's not just these erotic sleeping pictures as we saw before. Here there's um, there's sort of an ethereal Walter staring directly out at us. It's almost as though she's confronting him in a picture like this, but she still seems um, ethereal and beautiful. Over here on the right, this this is a painting that is called Sleeper with Shutters from 1936. That bright palette that we often associate with her is really subdued here. The, the colors are really grim. And even though she's supposed to be asleep, I see someone who is tortured emotionally. To me, she looks like she's crying. And this is a woman who's also just given birth within the past year. So all of these, um, these nudes, the exposed breasts that she's been um, depicted with over the past few years, now we see exposed breasts, breasts that are like functional breasts of, of a young mother here. Everything is changing in their relationship. Picasso said this was the worst time in his life. At this point, his wife, Olga, is, a, is aware of this affair with Walter but she's unwilling to give him a divorce. And so you can imagine Picasso feels stuck, Marie Therese Walter feels stuck, and yet he still has these other women in his life. Apparently Walter put up with it because she felt like he loved uh, her the best. So let's check in with another woman here. Who else was in Picasso's wife? A woman named Henriette Theodora Markovich, AKA Dora Marr. Let me introduce you to Dora Marr. This is such a funny picture with this tiny little, these tiny little hands here. <laughs> 
So um, a few months after the birth of his daughter, Maya, in 1936, Picasso began a relationship with Dora Maar, who we see here in a photograph by the artist Man Ray. Now, Dora Maar was born in France, but she was raised in Argentina, and that meant that she was fluent in Spanish, which was Picasso's mother tongue. And that allowed her to communicate with him in a way that really nobody else could in his life. She was an intellectual. She was witty. She was really Picasso's uh, intellectual equal. So they had... Um, they, they had a meeting of, a, of the minds more so than his um, meeting of the, of the flesh with, with Marie Therese Walter. She expected more out of Picasso and was not quite as submissive as Walter. And we'll see how that becomes explosive in their relationship. Dora Maar was a talented photographer. She was a poet. She was a painter. She attended the premier art school in all of France, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, and she studied photography with uh, Cartier-Bresson and uh, Man Ray. So she was bringing a lot to this relationship. Wait till you hear this. This is their meet cute story. Are you ready for this? Um, Picasso met Maar in the famous cafe, Les Deux Magots, in, um, in Paris. Uh, she was sitting at a cafe table, apparently with a knife, stabbing the negative space in between her fingers and occasionally uh, cutting herself. Picasso was so taken by her and watching her do this that he actually asked to keep her bloody glove afterwards. And, you know, like all great relationships, things went on from there. So I love this photograph of them over here on the right because she looks so bored and miserable. And it's a great reminder that even if you're in the hottest love affair of your life, you can still go out on a bad date. Dora Mar was 29 years old. And at this point, Picasso's already 55 years old. Soon they begin living together. Now there is drama throughout. Um, Dormar's parents were very strongly opposed to this relationship and apparently one night when she was fighting on the phone with her mother about her relationship with Picasso, her mother died due to a stroke. She was so upset about this relationship. Um, now the relationship between Picasso and Dormar was tempestuous. He was physically abusive towards her, um, but the relationship lasted for, for nearly a decade. And all the while, Picasso is still married and he has not ended his relationship with Marie Therese Walter. So, um, so a lot of drama in the 1930s, to say the least. And we see it play out visually with his paintings of these women. Now, all of these romantic entanglements prove to be very fruitful for Picasso's uh, artistic career, but they were emotionally wrenching for the women in his lives. Now, these portraits of Walter over here on the left and Dora Maar on the right were both done in 1937. They are alluring and fascinating abstractions in their own right. Walter is still all of these kind of uh, sensual, cool uh, um, uh, curves that we saw before and these, these kind of soft and sweet lines and colors. Dora Maar appears a little bit more mature, perhaps a little more self-possessed. We always see her with her, well, we almost always see her with her fingernails painted. So it gives her this kind of jagged edge. Um, and of course, Picasso would be interested in her fingers after that, the way that they met there, right? So, um, so we can see with both of these portraits, he is painting them sort of in profile and frontally at the same time. He's kind of compressed those two perspectives into one face here. Um, it's not necessarily the most flattering way to paint the loves of his life, but it's certainly innovative and really interesting. Things quickly shift for Dora Maar, as we can see over here, um, or at least the way Picasso paints her quickly shifts. She becomes prickly. She becomes a wailing. She's literally broken up by all of this cubist faceting that we see over here. There are these sharp angles to her. Picasso uses um, all of these, these jagged lines to portray her in stark contrast to Marie Therese Walter, who is still voluptuous and curvy over over here on the left. And of course, she is weeping. She becomes known as Picasso's weeping woman. It seems as though she's crying over Picasso's apparent callousness towards her. This is his intellectual equal, and he is... Um, 
he's shattered her. She is this sobbing, wretched mess in her pic, in his pictures. So it's almost as though he is, um, he's intimidated by strong women in his life. He resents his dependence on, uh, uh, on women. And so he's trying to overcome it in the form of dominating them. And at least he's doing that with Dora Maar visually. We can see that he goes back to this motif of the weeping woman again and again and again over the next few years. And it seems like the documentation of this completely tortured, toxic relationship. It's chilling to me to think about the causing this kind of pain in another human being and then sitting down and thinking i'm going to capture this on canvas or on paper it's even worse to just to distort their suffering into something that's so terrifying to behold and dora mar admitted she said he used me till there was nothing left of me nothing but the hundreds of portraits he painted she didn't like any of them and she said they're all the portraits are lies they're Picasso's, not one is Dora Maar. And this leads us up to Picasso's, probably his most famous painting, and that is Guernica. Um, his 1937, his massive mural, it's about um, 26 feet long. And it's the portrayal or sort of the aftermath of the Nazi bombing of this small Spanish town. Um, there were uh, it, more than a thousand lives lost and Picasso was just um, riveted to to the news of, of this awful uh, uh, tragedy and uh, this really aggressive act on, on, be, on the behalf of the Germans. So we know that he was using these abstracted paintings of his lovers as inspiration for many of the, the figures of the women in this painting. But there is this incredible story tied to his love life and this picture in particular. It's 1937. He has been keeping Marie Therese Walter and Dora Maar away from each other as much as possible. In fact, I'm not sure if they'd ever even met before. But one day when he's working on this painting, they both came to his studio and they were confronting each other. They were confronting Pablo Picasso and they said, you must choose. Who do you want to be with? And as he's painting, he sort of says, well, I like things the way they are. Why don't you fight? Why don't you decide, you fight it out? And apparently these two women began to wrestle in front of this monumental picture of war and the devastation of war. And what makes it even worse is that Picasso recounted this to a later lover and said, you know, this memory of these two women fighting over him was one of his choicest memories. Unbelievable. He actually documented the whole thing in another picture, um, which is called Birds in a Cage from the same year and um, and he is showing in this picture that the black bird, which is Dora Maar, um, overcomes the beautiful white bird, which is Marie Therese Walter. So the black dove wins and Picasso spends more time with her following this. Um, that's not really good for Dora Maar in the end, as we'll see. And we'll see that he continues to have relationships with both of them and to sort of set them up for comparison for all time by essentially painting them in the same positions in the exact same place in radically different styles, which would suggest to us, the, the viewers, that he has radically different feelings about these women. Now, in the interest of time, we are going to shift gears, enter Francoise Guillot, who was unlike any of Picasso's other lovers. You can only go on with so many torrid love affairs at one time here. So here is Guillot. Um, she was... Um, even younger than Picasso's other lovers. She was born in 1921 and remarkably is still alive today. I believe she just turned 101 last month. She was already trained, well, she had been training to become an attorney, but had given that up to pursue the arts, had already um, exhibited prior to meeting Pablo Picasso in 1943. Here they are um, shortly after they became an item. Uh, Gilo was 23 years old when she met Picasso. He was 62 and apparently he wooed her for months and ultimately she surrendered her virginity to him, at least according to one historian. Now, despite her youth, we're going to see that Gilo had a different dynamic with Pablo Picasso. You might even say that she refused to play the role of vulnerable lover. So his portrayals of her are 
are really something different. Um, early portrayals of, of Gilo show this kind of lyrical um, uh, um, uh, uh, idea of, of, of an intelligent and engaging sort of ethereal beauty here. She has this massive loose mane of swirling hair. She almost appears like a sorceress here. It's certainly she's an enchantress. There's a directness and an intimacy here that you don't get from somebody posing for you in an armchair across the room. Now, um, uh, Let's uh, let's also just pause for a moment to reflect upon the fact that there are still all of these other women in Picasso's life after he meets Gilo. Here he is following her with the massive umbrella on the beach in the south of France. Well, his first wife, Olga Kokolova, um, lived nearby and apparently she would bust into their apartment every now and then and attack Gilo and like pinch her and slap her. But this was all just part of life for Picasso. So everybody just put up with it. Now he continued to be just absolutely fawning in love with young Gilo and everything seemed to be going well until she had a baby. <laughs> and we can see that there's a real shift in the way that he portrays her. It's like the honeymoon period is over. Gilo actually gives birth to two of Picasso's children, Claude in 1946, who we see depicted here with the green skin. Um, this is a, a son who was born nearly a quarter of a century after his first son. And then Paloma was born three years after that when Picasso was close to 70 years old. So we can see that he is painting beautiful Francoise Guillaume now with green skin, half of her, you know, gone is that big mane of swirling hair, half of her head is bald. He's turned her into sort of a, a like a grotesque. And apparently he said to her, you were a Venus when I met you. Now you're a Christ and a Romanesque Christ at that with all the ribs sticking out to be counted. Um, things really got dark between the two of them. And he would oftentimes portray her um, still kind of lost and absorbed in her art. By all accounts, she was a fond mother who was always doting on her kids. When he painted her, she always kind of seems to be ignoring them and, um, and working on her sketches. She was, like I said, a painter in her own right. And it really seems like her divided attention was something that, that really, um, really irked her, her lover there. Uh, actually, in fact, one of Picasso's friends once chided him, it's easy to see that there's a dimension of her inner life, which has escaped you. So how did things end for poor Francoise Guillaume? We can see that, um, that once things shift, he does begin to portray her in a very different light. Um, she is not that same ethereal beauty. She hated his philandering. He refused to stop. Apparently she's sunk into a horrible depression that you can, I think, see a little bit of in these paintings from the mid 1950s. Um, over here, you can see this kind of a concerned look on her face, even though he's flattened up her body like one of those Amazon boxes. Over here on the right, uh, it's that it's that same really kind of direct portrait that he started with uh, early on in their relationship, but now it's on a black background. And now instead of these eyes that are gazing into your soul, they're really vacant, aren't they? She sort of, um, she sort of removed herself emotionally from this relationship. Picasso said to her, women are machines for suffering. Apparently this was such a dark time for both of them that even Picasso said he was considering suicide. So you got to leave that relationship or you got to find somebody that makes you happy. And that's exactly what Picasso did. He goes off and he meets Jacqueline Roque. She um, becomes a steadying presence for him over the last two decades of his life. Here is Jacqueline in, um, in two photographs. She was 26 when she met him. Picasso was 72 years old. That's a 46 year age gap. She was younger than his first son. They first met in, um, in a pottery studio where he was doing his uh, ceramics. Apparently he tried to woo her for some time, bringing her a rose every day. He um, drew a big chalk uh, dove on the side of her, of her house. And then um, once Olga Koklova, his first wife passed away and Jacqueline Rock was um, finally divorced, that is when she and Picasso were wed. Now he did continue to 
pursue other women outside of his marriage, at least initially. But she warned him that if one day there is another muse, I'll congratulate her. I'll send her flowers, but I'll be out the door. And from that point forward, Picasso didn't paint another woman again. And you'll see that um, that Roque ex uh, exacts a lot of, of control over his life and his contacts. Now, they had a stormy relationship. There were um, separations and reconciliations over the time, but she remained loyal to him to the end. So he always sort of develops a new style or at least a new way to depict the women in his life, he um, at least initially shows Roque um, as sort of sphinx-like, right? She's got this super long neck. He sort of exaggerates her, um, her Greek nose that we see over here. And he portrays her more than any other woman in his life. In one year alone, he painted 70 portraits of her. So basically he's sitting down every week and making a portrait so than every week. With, um, with Roque, you get this sense that she is alert <laughs> she's looking out for other women maybe but she's there to protect him and that really was one of her biggest goals all along the way it's almost as though he found somebody who was um, as beautiful to him as Gilo was um, but he turns her away she's not as obsessed with him she's obsessed with protecting him that's what he gets um, with Roke and with this long time that they spend together at the end of his life at the end of his career he sort of cycles back through every Everything that he's done over this long career. And he does some remixes. This is a very realistic portrait that he does of Roque. Um, it sort of reminds me of those realistic portrayals of Olga Kokova that he started with in the 19 teens. But he starts, like I said, sort of remixing some of his greatest hits. And with these portraits of, um, of Roque from the 1960s, you sort of get like reminiscences of, of Walter or maybe a little bit of Dora Maar with like these swirling patterns these soft lines here, the distortions in the face. You almost always know that it's Roke though, because he makes this prominent nose that, um, that goes all the way up the, the entire forehead for her. Now, this is, um, this is, this is sort of mean, but some art historians uh, read into the fact that Picasso paints Roque with his beloved dog, Kabul, uh, several times. And, and of, of course, we think of dogs as being loyal. And so perhaps he chose to portray her with the dog because he felt like maybe he was being loyal, but I think it's really that, that Rook was so loyal to him. In fact, Picasso once said, she's made um, something of a religion out of me. She would kiss his hand. She would actually call him her God. Notice in these pictures that um, instead of compressing two different uh, perspectives of, of the same face, he, it's as though he's, um, he's sort of uh, flattening out the face here. And it's almost as though we're seeing two faces combined in some of these paintings. As we get towards the end of Picasso's life, we see a little bit of this isolation playing into his paintings. This is a picture called The Kiss from 1969. Um, this is at a time when he and Rook are essentially not seeing other people. His life is so carefully controlled. Uh, we can see the couple pressed together. This is most certainly a self-portrait of Pablo Picasso. Notice that he is twice the size of her. Notice that he is distorting her and, um, and really exaggerating his, his, um, his own uh, face and, 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 uh, and facial features here. So um, you could maybe think of this as like a passionate embrace. Maybe you think of it as tender. Maybe it's serene. Maybe it's something else. I sort of see it as something else. In any event, Picasso dominates this picture. It seems to be all about his desire, his thoughts, his needs. So let's wrap up with our epilogue for tonight. Um, what happens to his first wife, the first lover that we touched on? This is a portrait of Olga from 1929. Now, they were together uh, officially, I think, for 18 years until her death. 
uh, she was she essentially was sent uh, sent into a nervous breakdown because of all of his cheating, and she harbored a lot of ill will against him because of it. She would send him hate mail throughout his life, and even when her when their son Paolo becomes pa uh, Pablo Picasso's chauffeur and drives around with him all over Europe, she packed her life into a suitcase and would follow them around. And as you know, she would break into his house occasionally and apparently assault some of his other their lovers. So it's safe to say that he, uh, his behavior sort of drew, uh, drove her mad. Now she passed away um, due to cancer and apparently asked to see her husband um, as she was nearing her death, but he refused. Um, and like I said, she passed away in 1955. Now, what of young Marie Therese Walter, who we can see here sort of sleeping, lounging on, on a chaise lounge here with an artist portraying her in the background. This is called the Artist Studio from 1934. Picasso um, was really, uh, stayed strangely committed to Walter and their daughter, visiting them twice a week throughout um, throughout the 1940s even. And actually in 1955, when his wife Olga Koklova died, he calls up Marie Therese Walter on the phone. This is after decades of her being his side piece, really, of him cheating on her. He calls her up and asks her to marry him, but she refused. And um, uh, it was really hard for her after he passed away. She didn't quite know what her role in the world was. So four years after his death in 1977, Marie Therese Walter hanged herself at the age of 68. That brings us to Dora Maar, the weeping woman. How did things end for Dora Maar? Well, um, their affair essentially ended when Picasso started dating uh, Francoise Guillot. And at that time, Dora Maar told Picasso, as an artist, you may be extraordinary, but morally speaking, you are worthless. She essentially had a total mental breakdown. Picasso paid for her to go and get psychiatric treatment, which included electroshock therapy, um, which was considered so, um, so harsh that one of her friends intervened, went to Picasso and said, you are continuing to torture this woman, even now, even though she's now out of your life. So following that, Dora Mart lived a very quiet existence. Uh, Picasso bought her a house in the south of France. She retired there, eventually made her way back to Paris. Um, and I, as I understand it, I, she continued to work as an artist, but when she passed away at the age of 19, uh, at the age of 89 in 1997, it was, um, it was kind of a sad, quiet little life that she was living. But I will say in recent years, there's been a lot of renewed interest in her work as an artist beyond her identity as a lover of Picasso. There has um, just in recent years been an internationally touring exhibit of her photographs. So um, her legacy, I feel like is really being buoyed in this really interesting way. The next woman we're going to, to uh, sort of give the, the update on is Jacqueline Broke. Uh, Picasso's second wife, who remained married to him um, for some 20 years until his death. Like I said, she was devoted to him. She was the protector. Notice how she's here with the cat now. <laughs> now, she actually banned his children and a number of his family from seeing him in his final years and actually banned them from even attending his funeral. It, um, it was so devastating to one of his grandsons that he, his grandson actually ended up committing suicide as a result of that, um, as that denial of attending his, his grandfather's uh, funeral. Roque had such passionate feelings about Picasso that apparently the, the night of his funeral, she slept on his grave in the snow. Um, in the years to follow, she had a really contentious uh, um, uh, legal battles with, with several of his heirs, deciding how that estate would be split up, ultimately uh, creating, helping to create the, the, the Picasso Museum in Paris. Um, but Picasso, uh, but depression, I should say, came sneaking up on her too. I think after she felt like she'd done everything to protect his legacy, um, there was depression and there was alcohol. And ultimately she took her own life several years after Picasso's death in 1986. So there's one woman left and she's the one woman left standing. And you know what? 
she's the only woman out of the women that we talked about tonight who left Picasso. She said, one's ego is not satisfied, satisfied by the fact that one had been painted by Picasso. She was an artist in her own right. She wanted to make her way in the world. He sabotaged her career as an artist. When she left, he told dealers, don't buy her work. Um, in 1964, she wrote a tell-all book called Life with Picasso. It sold millions of dollars. And he was so mad at her that he refused to ever see their children again, but she used the money that she made from that book um, to create a legal case so that her children could um, legally become his heirs again, because he was still married to Olga Koklova when, when they were born. So, um, so she went on and she had a, a second act and really a third act too. She ends up marrying the creator of the polio vaccine, Jonas Salk in 1969. And just to give you a sense of, of, of um, Francoise Guillot, uh, she was at a cocktail party once and somebody asked her, what was it like to, ha to have been the partner of Picasso and Jonas Salk? And apparently Guillot replied, why don't you ask them what it was like to be with me? <laughs> so we end with Picasso. This is one of his last self-portraits, self-portrait facing death in 1972. Um, he worked right up until the day he died, right up till 3 a.m. Um, and we can see uh, perhaps in the last years of his life, maybe he's not just confronting his own mortality. Maybe he's even confronting how he lived his life. Who knows, right? Maybe I'm giving him too much credit. He was buried at one of the castles he owned. Um, and to mark his grave is this uh, sculpture that he created, that, which was supposedly inspired by the figure of Marie Therese Walter. Like I said, she was his greatest, perhaps his most enduring love. Jacqueline Roque um, was also buried there according to her wishes. Um, and so we end tonight sort of thinking about Picasso's greater legacy. When he passed away, his estate was valued at somewhere close to a billion dollars in today's money. So we can imagine that there were a lot of people involved who wanted a stake in all of that. Um, there were a lot of women along the way who inspired his work, who inspired his creativity. Tonight, we got to appreciate their stories, their contributions, their suffering too. We, I hope we've come away with a better understanding of Picasso's work and the vital role that these women played in its creation. So I will end there for now, and I welcome your questions or comments about Pablo Picasso and the women in his life. I'll start going through these questions in the chat here. JD says, um, Les Demoiselles standing up against the wall, are they looking down on them laying down on a bed? Or are, wait, are we looking down on them or uh, laying down on a bed? Um, that's a great question, JD. I always thought of these women as sort of standing in a doorway. Um, and let me just make sure everybody knows which one we're talking about here. This is the Demoiselle again. Um, I don't think of them as lying down. This is like a fruit still life here. So I always thought, sort of thought of this figure as sort of squatting and these other women as sort of like opening up curtains into this kind of back area where you would go in a brothel perhaps. Um, Anne says, why are Olga's hands and fingers so chunky and formless? Great question, Anne. I think we see that in a lot of the portrayals of, um, especially over here. This was that neoclassical uh, period where he's making her look like this massive sculpture, this kind of over life size, uh, massive, almost masculine sculpture. But we can see that he really um, exaggerates hands throughout um, these, throughout the many relationships that we had that he had we, we definitely see it with Marie Therese Walter and with Dora Maar too um, but that was part of that neoclassical style that he had uh, that relates to um, to Olga in particular Lisa says why didn't Picasso get a vasectomy he definitely needed one Lisa right yeah, he, this man just got into hot water again and again. Margaret, thanks for your kind words. Roland says, what a creative, tempestuous life. 
really, can you imagine, you'd think he'd learn a lesson here or there, or you think like people wouldn't stick around with him for as long as they did, because he was clearly causing a lot of heartache along the way. Um, Bruce, Karen, thanks for your kind words, Susan, you too. Um, why did one of his last paintings have an X on her face, Alice asks, and I'm wondering if he's talking about um, Jacqueline or... Let's see. I'm not sure if I know which one you're talking about, Alice, but it could certainly be because of his changing moods about his about the women in his life. Who is to say? Amit, thank you so much for your kind words. Elaine, I feel the same way. I, I, I had a sense that he got into a lot of hot water with, um, with his relationships, but I, I got an eyeful putting this program together. So I'm glad there were some surprises there for you. Um, Janine says those look almost like Diego Rivera. Did they know each other? Also, why do you think he has not been part of the cancel culture? Janine, both great questions. I'm not sure if he knew Diego Rivera off the top of my head. Um, I was trying to sort of get a sense in terms of who were his friends and who were his friends in the art world. Uh, apparently he was chummy with Matisse at a certain point and Chagall, but Diego Rivera, I don't know. But I mean, Rivera was the one who tried to get a note from his doctor saying that he was physically incapable of being faithful. So you would think he and Picasso would really hit it off. Um, the cancel culture piece to this, right around the time of, time of me too. There were a lot of articles that came out that were sort of focusing on what kind of guy Picasso was. So it's, I mean, it's always that thorny issue of can we, like, how do we, can we separate someone's life work from their personal life and who they were? And I think as a culture, we haven't really defined that line. Certainly we wouldn't do that for somebody like Adolf Hitler, but we might do it for another politician do we do that for um do we do that for artists and how bad did they have to be before we say no no it's not okay so the cancel culture piece of this is is really interesting but i think i i think at this point i mean you wouldn't be writing books about saying um olga was so jealous and always making a scene because it probably seems as though her behavior was right in line with um with what one might what might do in a situation like that um, Pamela, thank you so much for your comments. And Terry says, who is Picasso within the last slide? That was with his last wife. That's Jacqueline Roque. But notice that they're standing in front of the painting of Olga in the dance from 1925. Interesting that he still had it in the collection. And I also think that it's so fascinating that it's like an over life-size picture as well. Um, Karen says, do you know how his estate was settled after he died? Well, all I do know, Karen, was that it was a battle because there's like legitimate child, illegitimate children. There are so many women along the way. It was a big legal battle. And in the end, I think Jacqueline Rook was only willing to sort of like give up some uh, in order to establish the museum. I'm not sure exactly how everything was divided up, but as far as I understand, um, Gilo's children uh, did become heirs to his estate. Um, so for example, I think one of her children is now worth like $600 million. So there's, there's still so much money there. It's really amazing. Um, without all these women is, in his life, would his work have been the same? And that's the ultimate question, right? He certainly had passionate relationships with them. So many of his paintings depict them. I mean, right, he had all these kids too, and he would paint pictures of them, but the pictures of the kids didn't seem to be pushing his art along. And I, you know, it reminds me of, um, musicians. I think of like Billy Joel, who wrote, I think, some of his best music when he was really heartbroken. And I think the same, you could probably make the same case about Picasso. Maybe he was making his best art when he was feeling alive and like uh, had a new relationship with a new woman. So I think these women had huge contributions to his artistic output. Um, I think if he was an artist now, it would be different, says Rachel. I would agree, <laughs> Rachel. I don't know if he could get away with any of this today. Um, Janine says, that's the one with the X. This one here, uh, if I'm still on the same picture. Oh, the X. Um, Janine, I have to go back to your other comment here. Let me just get... Uh... 
sorry, I'm a little discombobulated. I forget what the question about the X was. Um, sorry about that. Let's see. Anne says, which of his children became artists of some sort? Off the top of my head, Anne, I'm sorry, I don't have that information. I know that one of Jacqueline Guillot's children is now um, a successful jewelry maker. And Jacqueline Guillot, who, uh, so, sorry, Francoise Guillot, <laughs> who's now 101, was featured in the New York Times earlier this year and called an it girl in the art world. Her, her paintings are selling for over a million dollars now. Um, so she's being appreciated in her own right. The Geniuses series on National Geographic with Antonio Banderas is an excellent Picasso piece. Um, thank you, Janine, for adding that. I'm going to have to look into that. Why is there an X on his, on, on the face of, oh, over here. <laughs> Good question. Clearly someone who wronged him. I'm not sure about that painting over there, but that might be something I have to delve into. Um, looking at the Q&A here now too, who uh, we answered, who is Picasso with in this last slide? That's his last wife, um, Roque. And with all of the philandering he did, he must have sired other children. Are any others known? Diane, great question. All we know of is the one with Olga, the one with Marie Therese, and then two with Gilo. How many living heirs are left? Uh, that's a great question. I believe, who, well, I don't know because now there's all these grandchildren too. So um, I'm not quite sure how many are left today. It's, it's a bigger family than you might imagine, but the descendants down Marie Therese Walter's line, Walter line um, are definitely hypercritical of who Picasso was as a person and really how he treated the women in his life. Tossed them out as soon as he gave birth, he stuck with the last one because she was, because he was afraid of old age. Judith, I have to, I tend to agree with that assessment. Um, thank you for your kind words. Um, Merry Christmas, Barbara. Thank you for joining us tonight. And Diane says, I remember reading that when Picasso wanted to pay a restaurant tab, he simply did a sketch on a tablecloth. I remember reading that as well. I mean, clearly he was a celebrity. He's a multimillionaire. I would accept that as payment as well. It was probably worth much more than the cost of a dinner. <laughs> was cubism limited to Picasso or did anyone carry the torch further? I mean, I'm not sure if, um, if Brock carried it further but he is like the co-founder of Cubism with an artist named Georges Braque. And there's another French artist named Leger who, who might, who you could say maybe took it a little bit further or continued it on in a different direction. So he wasn't the only one really practicing it, but he was considered um, uh, a, like uh, ultimately a, a, an important uh, co-founder of that movement. Did he ever do any commissions? Now I'm thinking I was so wrapped up in these portraits of these women. I'm sure he did some commissions over time, Diane. That's a great question, but I, off the top of my head right now, I'm blanking on them. So, um, as an artist, I mean, he really didn't have to do anything. He didn't want to, I mean, in for decades of his life, we know that when he was, uh, when he met, Olga, for instance, he was working as like a set designer and a costume designer for the ballet. So, so he did do some, at least in the beginning, but, um, but I think he had a, a great deal of freedom later on in his life. Um, Ian asked, did women appear in any of his ceramics? Great question, Ian. I didn't even delve into that facet of his artistic output. Something tells me, yes, they did. <laughs> All of those fleshy forms. I think I can recall seeing photographs of Picasso now with these like very um, voluptuous faces <laughs> that he was standing next to that definitely looked like uh, specific women in his life. Uh, sorry, I didn't add that element into this picture, into this presentation, because that would be really interesting too. Um, oh, oh, I, you know, I really appreciate that you liked this one. Uh, I think it's always fun to add in this, this personal element. Sometimes artists have got some really juicy stuff like this, and sometimes their lives are a little bit boring. So it was, this was fun to really delve into the artist's life. Um, also, Juan Gris, uh, uh, JD adds uh, as another major cubist. Thank you so much. Did pa Picasso do any portraits of men? He did many portraits of men. I would say they're not as fascinating to look at, uh, but um, 
but we just know that the the relationships with female with the women are are um, are sort of riddled with with these strange dynamics. So um, so I think that makes them a little bit more entertaining to behold. Laura asks, did he mostly do paintings of women? Uh, for the most part, he really gravitated towards young, beautiful women, as you can see. So even towards the end of his life, even after he met Jacqueline Roque, um, he was painting young, beautiful women. Uh, um, one of them in particular, uh, her name is escaping me. She's known as the girl with the ponytail, um, Sylvette da David. He did many portraits of her. She had this sort of high ponytail, a uh, beautiful young woman, but he never had a relation, a, a sexual relationship or a romantic relationship with her. So he, he, that's where the inspiration was. Did he, uh, da, 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 mostly paintings of women. What else did he do? <laughs> Well, I think we have a good sense in terms of how he spent his free time, but yep, it was mostly um, art about art, art about paintings, and um, and I, I mean his his artistic output was so expansive. It's hard to touch on everything tonight, but I appreciate all of your interest, all of these great questions. Chelmsford, you continue to be like this incredible community of of, of art lovers, and I so appreciate your interest and, and, um, and your curiosity tonight. Thank you so much for, for being with me through all of this. Oh, well, we really appreciate all of your time, all of your extra time online tonight. Um, the photo of him with rolls in his fingers shows he had a playful side. Other examples? Um, oh, there is this great photograph of him um, sitting at a table with like these big French croissants kind of um, that look like they're big <laughs> hands. <laughs> I wish I had a picture yes. of it. It's a, yeah, it's a great photograph. Are there other examples of his playfulness? That's a really good question. Um, I, one of the things I, I sort of stumbled across in preparation for tonight's program was just these advertisements that he um, that he was looking at. I think it was in the 1970s, even maybe the 1960s. And he would just um, they were like women's. There were advertisements for like women's clothing or perfume or something, but with like really elegant women featured in these photographs. And he would just do these little elaborations, these little drawings on on the photos, and make them kind of silly and playful. So I think there was kind of a, a fun side to his personality. That's a great question. Was he possibly the first rock star in art? Maybe, maybe. I mean, because like like, to, like I, within I, his yeah. lifetime. Yeah, I, I think you could say that because, I mean, before the 20th century, we didn't really have mass media. Our other right. artists couldn't be appreciated in this way. He certainly opened the door for Andy Warhol, right? Right, right, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Jane. Um, that was a wonderful talk. And um, as always, I will send this chat, I will send everything out tomorrow. Um, and Thank you all so much for your great questions. And I really appreciate your time, Jane. It's we'll always see you a next pleasure. time. Thank you so much. We'll see you in January. Bye, everybody. Happy holidays. Take Happy care. holidays. Good night. Good night.